My name is Sumantra and uh, this will be basically an introduction to image morphing. So not quite this, but the idea of morphing is actually pretty interesting. The idea of morphing is basically you start off with one source image, one has a destination image and one wants to interpolate. One wants to interpolate the frames in between and try to see the effect. For example, this is something that I found off the net. And this might look like a fun exercise. And after all, if you remember in the 1980s, there was this uh, Kawasaki Bajaj ad, wherein uh, there was this Kawasaki Bajaj motorcycle that had morphed into a cheetah. Okay, that's a one-dimensional version of morphing. That's called queening. Okay? But this sort of thing, if one wants to do things like a feature-preserving morph, then it's actually got a good bit of math underlying it. In a feature-preserving morph, for example, you want eyes to morph onto eyes, you want eyebrows to morph onto eyebrows, a nose to morph onto a nose. In that case, what one generally does is one triangulates the original image and then one uses something called affine invariance. One uses an affine transform and does this particular morphing operation. So there's actually a good bit of math behind it. Okay, now since I'm running out of time, can I be permitted to take a bit longer? I have a couple of very interesting things to show you. Okay, motion analysis. Motion image compression, video data analysis can be used for automatic processing of videos. And this is something, let me see whether I can run it or not. You can identify the dominant moving of moving object in a video. Okay? So here in this case they have been marked with black pixels. It's just like the title of that Alfred Hitchcock movie, The Lady Vanishes. This is exactly what has happened. So what has basically happened is we have identified the moving pixels and replaced them with the corresponding pixels in adjacent frames corresponding to the background. It's possible to remove moving objects from videos automatically. I'll, I'll describe the algorithm in detail tomorrow. So there's incentive to listen to me tomorrow. As well. <laughs> okay, this is another interesting thing. This is motion stabilization. See, this sort of thing uh, came into prominence, especially with news reports during the Kosovo conflict and the 1991 Gulf War. And there were lots of videos taken from the back of jeeps and military vehicles, which were not stabilized. By stabilization, one, it's basically shown that psychologically, the most irritating thing about an unstabilized video is the rotation part. Translations don't irritate us too much, but it's a rotation that's most irritating. Now, if one can estimate these rotations and unrotate the image back, one gets stabilized videos. Okay? Nowadays, a lot of high-end cameras come with inbuilt image stabilization. Okay? See, stabilization is important because even if you want to shoot image in low light, typically what does one do? Especially if one has an analog camera. Have you tried shooting images in low light using an analog camera? It generally doesn't work until you have a tripod. Because you need a very, very steady platform and a very steady hand. Okay, so it's important. Okay, something interesting is image-based render. We talked about a motivation for... When, when I introduced this topic on image processing, I talked about a historical motivation. In this case, let's again take a historical motivation for how about a prehistoric. Do you remember this guy? Yeah, this is T-Rex, Jurassic Park. I said I'll talk about movies, I will. Okay, now these frames I found from the World Wide Web. This is from possibly Jurassic Park Part 2, The Lost World. Now from this I wanted to gauge the difficulty of using graphics-based techniques, techniques which are purely based on computer graphics. Look at these set of things. From here, you note that, yeah, this is Stegosaurus walking in front of these guys. Here again, 
here again and here. Okay? Now note that this graphics figure what is behind these PPPs. Okay? And to get these, a wireframe model was created. This is a pure graphics technique. Using 3D coordinates, a wireframe model was created. Smooth surfaces were fitted on top of these triangles and polygons. After that, a texture was applied. Alright? And after that, for each wireframe model, there were motion models. There were models for each muscle. Okay, these graphics based techniques are pretty bad in terms of computational complexity. And perhaps computer scientists and artists work on every frame. And if you look at this, this is from Jurassic Park. And in reality, okay, this is actor Jeff Goldblum with a flame in his hand. The two kids are trapped inside this vehicle. And T-Rex obviously has some nasty intents on all three of these. And what is actor Jeff Goldblum running away from? Nothing. So when this shot was taken, there wasn't any T-Rex in the background, obviously. And you can gauge the difficulty of having a graphics model it is not just the wireframe model, not just the animation, not just the motion of the muscle, not just the smooth surfaces fitting on, fitted on the uh, triangles, not just the skin texture. What is more in this shot? It's nighttime, variable lighting, and, and, and worst of all, rain. There are reflections and inter-reflections which had to be modeled. And yet, the damn thing looks so realistic. So graphics-based techniques are pretty difficult, actually, to explain. Okay, so these are some corresponding models from the lost world. And now, image-based rendering. The idea is, if instead of using pure graphics techniques, one uses images. In images, Mother Nature has rendered the real world for us. Why do we need graphical models? If we can use images and graphics entities together, one can get something better. Now, ima now uh, image based rendering is still in its infancy. But there have been some cases where one has got some rather nice results. Like look at this. This is called this is something that's called view morphing. Okay, is this visible? Yeah. In this case, some assumptions have been made about the camera. This is basically a planar motion of the camera. And each intermediate image is physically quite realistic. Okay, you can see some points where the thing is not that realistic, but lots of interesting things can be done. Let's say, for example, one application of view morphing, image-based rendering is basically, let's say there's a real estate agent who has a couple of images of a piece of property. But the client wants to know, okay, how will this look from this angle? Now, the real estate agent does not have those images. So he can use, he or she can use those, some image-based rendering models and interpolate images in a realistic manner which is in concordance with the 3D model. In some cases, it's possible to do that. And this theory of view morphing actually gets some rather startling results. In this case, the start image and the end image were basically mirror images of Mona Lisa. Okay? And some of these intermediate images are quite physically realistic. Just this. For example, you can find out points where the model did not fit too well. Like you can see some artifacts around the ears. Okay, but otherwise, some of these techniques work reasonably well. Okay, these are picked up from the website of a person by the name of Steve Stites in the lecture today. This is basically quite topical because we all, like the moment there's a sting operation, somebody is caught on tape, if it's a politician, what he or she says is, hey, these images are more, or there's been some manipulation done. The question that we'd last like to ask ourselves is, can we find out whether something is indeed a fake or not, an image or a video? But the bad news is, in general, it is not possible to detect a hoax using a Just not possible. And it's often, at the end of the, at the end of it, it's the human expert's opinion and some context-specific information that helps in detecting hoaxes. I have just taken a couple of examples. 
some of these you might have received over the journey as well. Purporting to be something and yet the story behind them is something else. Like this, for example, came to me in an email as well. For example, this said that, well, this is one of the images that was found among the rubble in the World Trade Center and this was taken on that very day. Now this is a hoax. This is a documented hoax. How did people find out whether this was a hoax or not? The story is pretty interesting. Now look, this airliner is actually a pretty good Photoshop job. For instance, you can see that the lighting here is pretty consistent. Okay? And the pattern case job is pretty good. But however, there are some context specific things which help people deduce that, okay, this is a hoax. In this case, people found the original image. I think this is on one of my very favorite websites called airliners.net. The original image was there. Okay? And the second thing is, this is an image of the South Tower. And the airliner that hit the South Tower was not a Boeing 757, as is shown here, but it was a Boeing 767. So there's an actual inaccuracy. Plus there were other things. For example, around September 11, this sort of weather isn't expected. It would cause a person to be dressed up like this. Okay, so in this case, it was just context specific information. It was not possible to make it out automatically. Then this image of the US president looking through a set of binoculars which the covers of the pattern were opening. Okay? In this case, manually, even if you didn't use any super resolution technique, you would blow it up and found, find out that there's some telltale signs of manipulation. This is a documented thing. So let's have a quiz. I'll show a couple of images. I'll ask you whether George Bush is often there in the subject of a lot of ridicule. This is actually undetermined because even if this were true, then this would have been true just for, for uh, this would have been a momentary lapse because some other images taken of that event had the binoculars in their proper settings. In this, not the book here. Any guesses? Huh? This is a hoax. Yeah. This is a documented hoax. And interestingly, this is also a good photo job, Photoshop job, but this is the actual image. The photographer who took the actual image pulled up and said that well, this is the original photo. And the person who did this Photoshop operation actually did a very grand Photoshop job but made a very fundamental mistake. Because what he or she had was not an inverted book, but a mirror image of the inverted book. That gave it a Okay, so maybe this was done on purpose. Maybe to try and challenge people to find out whether something is original or not. So this was something I also received. And I asked, yeah, this apparently came after the uh, tsunami. So apparently the news said that there was this mermaid which had been washed ashore and the remains were kept at the Edmore Museum in Chennai. I believe a mermaid is referred to as Kadal Kandi. And um, my brother is in Chennai and I had asked him that time, well, why don't you go to the Edmore Museum and find out. He went to the museum didn't find anything like that. And later this was found to be a hoax. In fact, such emails had come even after some tropical storm had hit the Philippines long time back. So this is a documented thing. And this was something interesting. After the Columbia disaster, this was sometime in January 2003. Right? These images came about, apparently taken by an Israeli spy satellite of the space shuttle Columbia that was disintegrating by this. This is startling. I got this in an email from a friend and I didn't know. Any guesses? True or fake? Hoax or not? It looks actually very realistic. This is actually a hoax. Uh, because there are actually shots from a 1998 film called Armageddon, if you have seen the movie. What gave it away? No, not just people who have seen the movie, but this was basically the space shuttle discovery. I think there's a 
every space shuttle is slightly different from the other. And these, are these contextual pieces of information I gave it up. This is basically the result of graphics and very realistic graphics. Okay, but if one has seen the original movie, definitely. Amazingly, one of the most famous images in American history is actually of fake. Apparently there were not too many pictures of Abraham Lincoln in a heroic pose. The actual man here is John Carew. And this was obviously done with brush and paint. This is a fake. All right, in 2005, there was this major air disaster. Uh, there was an aircraft that belonged to Helios Airways. This Boeing 737 apparently flew. There was a decompression accident. The supply of oxygen went off. Everybody about that ill-fated flight perished, and the flight went on autopilot for more than two hours, then crashed into a hillside. And apparently, so taken off from Greece and somewhere over Italy, a couple of F-16s of the Italian Air Force were sent to investigate whether <coughs> what was going on. And after some days, some images came up on the internet saying that these were images taken from these F-16s. Any guesses? Yeah, this tells you that they were fakes. But it's interesting how people found that out. Looking at these images automatically, it was not possible to make up with the fake someone. But, again, my favorite website, www.airliners.net, it found a picture of the original illustrated airliner and the picture from which people had, some expert artist had photoshopped all of it. And in this case, again, context specific information. The illustrated aircraft was a Boeing 737-300 one overhang exit. These pictures are that of a Boeing 737-800 belonging to the same company which as you note here has two overhang exits. This is a factual inaccuracy. But just looking at these images alone it's almost impossible to find out whether it's okay. Right, there's been this Anaragutta case that's been in the news also. Right? And this is, uh, this is a pretty important problem now. Okay. This, as you recognize, is one of the Boeing 747s, which is called Air Force One. And it's one of the most protected airliners ever. Okay? So apparently this shows Air Force One being parked at the Edwards Air Force Base. And look, it's incredible what's, what's going to happen. There's this person who's there at one of these most heavily guarded facilities. He jumps over the fence and does something unimaginable to the aircraft. This is a documented fake. Now, I'd like to ask you, maybe can you guess how people found that it was a fake? Look at what's happening. This person jumps down, runs towards Air Force One. Oops, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's a kind of spray paint and there's some gravity on the engines. Now can you guess what gave it away? In this case, it was an artist by the name of Mark Echo. He documented it saying that, yes, this is fake. Okay, it's a piece of artistic expression. But what were things that gave it away? This video? Quite a few things. First is the shade of blue is slightly different from what has used in painting and Air Force One. Then this font is slightly different. Then plus aviation enthusiasts would find out that the engines here 
are different from this. In fact, the plane that's picturized here is a Boeing 747-100, and these are Boeing 747-200s. And a couple of other things. Then how was this executed? There are lots of these airplane graveyards, as they call it, in the US, where unused planes are taken apart or just stored in the desert. So what this artist did was, under secrecy, he went to one of these places and painted one side of a Boeing and shot this in That's it. And look at this. This appeared in a Korean language commercial for an energy drink. Okay, there are these canoeists, and suddenly a killer whale jumps out of the water and sinks one of these canoes. And amazingly, because apparently people in this canoe had had that energy drink, came up back again. Okay, this was in the news because this is one of the most valid examples of copy. In this case, again, people found out the original video. This is taken from. Uh, a very famous documentary on a killer whale named Lolita. It's called Lolita, a slave of nature. And from this famous award-winning video, they actually took this and digitally manipulated it. And because they had the original, you could find that. Okay, but in general, it's very difficult to find out. Over the years, hoaxes have happened in photography. Like this. This is from the early days of photography in the 1800s. Here is a bear which is posing along with its hunters. Okay. Amazing, we even thought of making this hoax. This is one of the most famous hoaxes of all times. This is now documented. It was there. This is a 1936 photo. It's called the Surgeon's Photo or something like that. It's apparently of the Loch Ness Monster. 70 years later, People behind this hoax actually admitted to it. It's actually a toy suffering. And these veins have been created by from the stone, something like it in the water. This is also a hoax, one of the most famous images of all time. The brown lady, apparently the image of a ghost. This is also a hoax. This is an overexposure and some film developing technique where another negative, some portion from another negative was taken and put forward. This apparently is that of an iceberg. This is also okay, and all of these are well documented. This. Another box. Okay, apparently this shows the Golden Gate Bridge, San Francisco. This is a marine who's been rescued by a helicopter and the great white shark jumping up here. We found out the original picture. This was taken off the coast of South Africa. Okay, and a very good Photoshop job. Any guesses about this? Hoax or not? Again from one of my favorite websites. They found out the original image. And in this case, look, American Airlines, if you've seen planes of American Airlines, they have a shiny, it's shiny all through, it's a metal, shiny metal. A fire on one of the engines would obviously have some reflection. So it's not there. And people found out the original image. But sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. This is a true image. The World Trade Center before that uh, horrible disaster. So is this. Because this apparently reads to be a hilarious statement. Right? This actually appeared on, on a news channel. Right? This was basically after the Katrina disaster struck. So this is what Bush basically said. One of the worst disasters to hit the US, but the way it appeared in the news channel is absolutely hilarious. Right? This is again a two set of images. In this case, yes, because this appeared in a very well-known journey. Okay. So, 
And there was a complete article based on that. And there were lots of other images as well taken from that. It's a great white shot. This again is a true image. This is basically the angle at which apparently a plane is just lifting off all of a sudden. And, no, this, the trick is basically played by the angle at which the photographer is observing it and this is basically a multiple exposure photograph. Okay, so same plate but exposures at very quick intervals of time. This is a true image. Okay, in fact talking of books is talking of digital ma uh, manipulation. How many of you have seen the movie Gajini? I think quite a lot of you. And the married men among you, how many of you have taken your wives to the movie? I did and uh, sometime after half time, the moment when Amir Khan appears in that sort of avatar, I realized I was in serious trouble. Then, <laughs> When my wife said, ooh, because nowadays these our stars get these six pack abs and eight pack abs and whatnot. Okay, earlier I used to say things, oh, these are special effects in movies, these are graphics techniques, you won't understand much about them, but now these are completely documented. And after the movie, and actually we have seen both both the originals, Christopher Nolan's Memento, as well as the original Murugadas, uh, the Tamil movie, Gajin, with uh, the hero named Sanjay Ramaswamy and I think it was Surya who was the hero there. And I took my wife to the Amit Khan version as well. I was in serious trouble, I realized. He says, look, those film stars are just doing something about it, about their middles, and what are you getting, apart from a big belly? I don't know. Okay, so just a... Doesn't aside. So sometimes talking of special effects doesn't help. So why is image processing or computer vision, why are they of a lot of interest and to whom should it be of interest? People in the signal processing community, of course, right? Because they treat images as two-dimensional signals and they are more fun. Then people in computer science, why? Because anything that has something to do with algorithm, you'll have a captive audience in the computer science community, in developing newer and more efficient algorithms. Statisticians, they look at images as random fields, just as you have random variables, random vectors. For two-dimensional entities, you have random fields. And with Markovian assumptions, people can get some nice results out of it. Statisticians are interested in it. People in psychology are interested in it. People in humanities are interested in psychology. Because some of these results, like the fact that a human being that the human brain does high pass filtering also is the result of some work of psychologists. Then basic work in recognizing shapes. That's also people in humanities are interested in it. People in philosophy are interested in it. A philosopher by the name of John Locke in, in the 1600s wrote about the theory of vision. There's a psychophysical component, there's a philosophical component. People in robotics are interested in vision. For example, in IIT Delhi, there are people in the mechanical department who are interested in vision. Okay, so they've got a then machine inspection. All of that involves working with images. Doctors. Doctors are obviously interested in images in a big way. Medical image processing. Control theorists, because most tracking basically has a control theory connotation to it. I'm going to talk about some of these techniques more. So control theorists are interested in images. People in networks are interested in images. Why? If there's a low bandwidth channel, then one wants efficient methods of encoding images and videos to be sent on that low bandwidth channel. So images are of interest to a large category of academic people. And it's also interesting to know, and in fact it's been my good luck, that I've been associated with two of the strongest image processing, vision and graphics groups in India both as a student and now as a faculty member in IIT Delhi and as a faculty member in IIT Bombay. We have some of the best equipped labs in the world. So if, and interestingly, there are image processing and computer vision groups in 
all IITs and lots of other important academic institutes apart from IITs, lots of defense labs, there are people in industry as well who would look for graduates, postgraduates as well as doctorates in these areas. Talk about Adobe, in terms of even private companies, talk about Adobe, talk about Samsung, GE, then among government uh, aided companies there's CDOT, CDAC, lots of them are working on video coding. Um, CMC, they have the first automated fingerprint analysis system. The second robot branch is no longer there at the Sarajini Jerry Road, but now no longer to Dachi Kaudi. So there are lots of people, not just in academia, but also in industry who are interested in images and people working with it. So just, uh, well, if faculty members are interested in coming over for higher degrees, at most educational institutes, quite a lot of educational institutes in India, there's a lot of scope for that. All that I wanted to say. No, this is not like a TV program and at the end of it you have a sponsor coming up with an ad. No, it's not in that sense. But just saying that image processing is image processing, computer vision, computer graphics. These are rather upcoming topics nowadays and there's a lot of scope for it. Thank you very much for your patience.